So I want to turn in your Bibles to Luke's Gospel, chapter 15. And we are reading from verse 11 down to 32. Then he said, A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like the one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf here and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to be merry. Now his oldest son was in the field and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come, and because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. But he was angry and would not go in. Therefore his father came out and pleaded with him. So he answered and said to his father, lo, these many years I have been serving you. I never transgressed your commandment at any time, and yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours came, who had devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive again, and was lost and is found. Usually when we look at the prodigal, the story in Luke's Gospel, chapter 15, we focus on the prodigal son, and uh, we explain the, all the intricacies of his disobedience and things like that, and uh, uh, invite people to come to the Lord and to experience His grace. But I want to, I'm led to share with you uh, not so much about the prodigal son, but about the father. which is a symbol of God, our Heavenly Father. And God, our Heavenly Father, longs, desires to have fellowship with us, that we may drink at His fountain, be refreshed, and our relationship with Him will deepen. And this story, because there are many storylines in Bible stories, and this storyline about the Father is an amazing uh, revelation of His attributes that we need to get into ourselves so that we can enjoy who our Father is. When this young boy, young man, came of age, he went to his father 
and ask for the portion that fell rightly to him. The Bible says that he went to his father and said, Father, give me what falls to me. The father may have known that this guy was not such a good money manager. But his father was a just man and respected the rights of his son, which teaches us an attribute about God. And Jesus tells this story uh, actually setting a contrast between human nature and God. In this story, we find many offenders. In fact, in the whole corpus of the text, we find the scribes and Pharisees on the one hand, ridiculing Jesus because he was spending time with sinners. And then we find the first offender, the young man who took advantage of his father and lived recklessly and did whatever he wanted. And then towards the end of the story, we find uh, the older son who through his self-righteousness was critical rather than happy about the fact that the younger brother had returned. And so on, on the one hand, we see all these offenders. And in stark contrast to those offenders, we see a revelation of our Heavenly Father who is righteous in all his ways. And there are at least three things here about the nature of God that would warm our hearts and help us to deepen our relationship with our Heavenly Father. And so the Father was just. Just like God is just. He did not interfere with the rights of his son, but he handed to them, to him, what was rightly his due. Because the father was just, and God is just. It makes sense to believe in a God who is just in a world of injustice, no justice, and flawed justice. We all know what that is and how frustrating it is to live in environments where there is no true justice. But we can console ourselves in this that in the midst of rampant injustice, God is a just God. Amen. Hallelujah. And He is our Father. And so when you're faced with a situation where you are the victim and you realize that you're being taken advantage of, and that you have no recourse, and no matter how much you pray, there is no answer. You can console yourself in the truth that God is just. And you are his child. And he will only permit injustice to happen to you to the extent that in his wisdom and providence, he decides it should be. And when you are going through those situations, I can guarantee to you that the presence of God will be with you. Life is full of injustice. We are not in heaven yet. This is earth. And we are to interact with people and deal with people who are unjust, who are partial, who discriminate. But God is just. Now, the interesting thing is, and all of us should remember this, that God doesn't stop you from sinning. Sinning. <laughs> he didn't stop Adam and Eve. 
Many people have sinned. Even people who claim to be followers of Christ, followers of God. God is not going to physically come and stop you from sinning. When the uh, Apostle John says, the one who knows the Lord cannot sin, is not talking about a physical cannot, it's talking about a moral cannot. God doesn't come physically and stop anybody from sinning. That is your right as a free moral agent. God created a human being, not a robot. And so you have a choice, and God respects that. That's important to remember, because I've heard some people say, why didn't God stop me from doing it? God won't stop you from doing it. Because he respects you. And he has given you a free will. So that you can make the choices. But the other thing to remember, of course, is that not only are you given the freedom to make your choices, you also have to live with the consequences. So this guy took his money and he spent it recklessly. We have a description of it. He lived riotously and then he lost everything and he was living on pig pods. One good thing about him though, the Bible says that one day he came to himself, that is he went into himself. And when he went into himself, he shook his head and he said, well, I better go back to my dad. He's got a much better environment there. And even if I'm a servant, it's much better than being in this condition. There's a good thing about this younger son. You know what that is? He didn't blame God for his predicament. Have you met some people who say, who blame God when they have made the wrong choices? Have you met any? There are people who make wrong choices and when the consequences come upon them, they blame God. Why did God allow this to happen? Well, if you jump from the third floor, you're going to break your limbs and you might not even live. God is not to be blamed for that. But this man didn't blame God. Good point. Then he got up and he went towards his father and to the home. And this is what we read. Verse 20, just listen to me. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. A very important verse in that parable. A parable is an earthly story with a spiritual and heavenly meaning. And when he started going home, we read here, Jesus is trying to illustrate something that is about the father's heart. First it was about the father's hand. Now it's about the father's heart. And here was the father looking Ever since the day he left that home, the father didn't give up. He was looking, waiting for his son to come back. Because the father's hand is a hand of justice and the father's heart is a heart of compassion. His heart is a heart of compassion. Folks, there's hope for you. There's hope for all of us. Because we've all messed up. Some have messed up outwardly more than others. And there are others who can mess up but keep it a secret. That doesn't make them any better because God sees it all. The son came back 
and very important words again. The father, the son said to the father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. And I'm no more worthy to be called your son. Today, we have hardly anybody preaching about sin and repentance. Most of the time, especially in Pentecostal and charismatic churches, ours is a charismatic church, no apologies. I'm an unapologetic uh, charismatic. But we don't believe in charismania. Today, Mostly in charismatic and Pentecostal churches, it is all about prosperity and wealth and, and getting ahead in life. This is all over the world. It's not just here, all over the world. But actually, you don't need God's help to be a successful businessman. Just be smart, do the right thing, and you'll succeed. But the thing is, when you succeed to keep God at the top of your life. That is the thing. That is the challenge that Christians have. The issue is not how to succeed. If you do business the right way, you will succeed. Sometimes. In certain societies, you will not. But nobody talks about repentance. And without repentance, it's impossible to have reconciliation with God restoration and repurposing your life. This guy came along and he came with a repentant broken heart. What he didn't know was that all the time he was away, his father was looking for him. There are many mysteries about the nature of God. There are many things that we do not know. Just like the son did not know that the father was looking for him all that time. And his eyeballs were just focused on the distance to see when his son would come. And his heart was overflowing with compassion. The son didn't know that. Just like many of us don't know many things about the nature of God. Because with our minds, we cannot comprehend. They didn't know, because the nature of God is mysterious. But there's enough revealed here for us. And that is that our Father's heart is oozing with compassion and love for His own. And if even if we mess up completely, we will face the consequences of it. Some consequences are short term. Some consequences are for the rest of our lives. But when you turn, when you have a change of heart and mind, and you turn from your way back to God, and when you come to Him, His heart of compassion will receive you and restore you. You'll be reconciled to him and you will know his peace and all the messed up areas may not get straightened out, but God will give you grace. No false promises. If you chop your hand off when you are away from God, when you come back, the hand is not going to grow but you'll have a few other people who'll help you, <laughs> you know, to walk around with one hand. And when you come back to him, you know what the father did? The father shouted to his servants and said, come on, bring a robe and put on him. A robe, symbol of restoration. Put a ring on his finger, which is a sign of affection and put sandals on his feet so that now he will know that he is no more a slave 
but he is a son. The sandals are a sign of sonship, the ring is a sign of God's affection, and the robe is a sign of restoration. And the fatted calf was the celebration. This is what happens when people come back to God. Isn't that wonderful? Amen. Not only is he just, he is full of compassion. He is overflowing with compassion. And God is calling me to enjoy his presence and to, to rejoice and to revel in his compassion. That does not give me an excuse to sin or a license to sin. It only tells me the reality that God wants to, to restore people. He wants to bring people back into their place where they can be used by him. He wants them to come into the full potential that he has designed for them. And nothing and no one should hold you back from coming to your father and experiencing his compassion. Aren't you glad? There's hope for all of us. Well, when they were having the big party, somebody came back from work. He was a good guy, the older son. And the older son heard all the, you know, all these musicians, uh, and they were playing and singing and having a good time. And instead of joining the group and saying, great to see my younger brother back, he got angry. So that's funny. It is funny. But this happens. <laughs> he began to compare himself and what he had got with what the brother got. He was angry. And he was jealous at what the father gave to the son. You know what had happened to him was that he was stuck, the older brother was stuck on a previous version of the younger brother's life. Okay? After he went away and now he came back, his life is changed, he had gone into himself, he had come to himself and his mind has said, now it is a revised version. But this guy was stuck with the previous version. Now, you know, you have in, uh, we have versions of the Bible, King James Version, New King James Version. Revised Version, New American Standard Version, English Standard Version, and so on. Okay? So you can have the previous version, and you can have the exaggerated, sordid version. The past one. I don't know whether you have heard people point to the previous version of other people who have come to the Lord. They can't seem to get away from the previous version. Don't any of you fall into that trap. Because you're like the older brother. <laughs> You don't want to be like him. God has intervened and changed a person's life. You don't need to get stuck on the previous version. The father didn't say, I told you so. The father didn't say, what did you do? And all that sort of thing. The father said, okay, come on. Because it's a father's job to forgive. This guy had repented and he was forgiven. The father looked at the older son who was a self-righteous person. They are both offenders. The younger fellow went and messed his life. The second fellow, the, I mean the older fellow, was a self-righteous person. And it's obvious from the story that the older brother, though he was living in the house, did not really understand all the resources that were with the father. 
he had the opportunity to build a relationship with his father. And though he was living in the same house, he did not have a relationship with his father. That is why the father said, all that I have is yours. So he, in other words, the older brother had not appropriated everything he had. And this was a kind of a side swipe against the scribes and Pharisees who were criticizing Jesus. And uh, Jesus was probably uh, giving this message across so the religious leaders of the day would understand that you can be a religious person, you can have all the paraphernalia of religion and not really have a relationship with your father. And that's what made them jealous of Jesus also. The older brother was angry. But there's no reason to be angry because not only is a father's hand just, not only is a father's heart full of compassion, but the father's house is plentiful. There's enough in the father's house for everybody. There's no reason to be jealous if God gives gifts to somebody else, which I don't get. No reason to be jealous, because God has chosen it. There's no reason to be competitive in whatever work you do, whether it's your job or even in Christian work. Sometimes people can get jealous about other people's progress. There's no reason for that. There's enough grace, there is enough forgiveness, there is enough restoration, there is enough reconciliation, there is enough love, there is enough compassion, there's enough gifts in the house of the Lord. And when I'm talking about the house of the Lord, I'm not talking about Calvary Church, I'm talking about God's resources. We are just one aspect of God's house. It doesn't matter whether you meet in a building like this or under a tree. You're the house of God when the people of God gather together. So I'm talking about the house of God, I'm talking about the resources, God's kingdom, enough for everybody. But the mistake is that a lot of people don't appropriate the resources and the riches that God has. There's no reason for the older son to be angry and jealous. He was living in the house. The father said, all that I have is yours. Yes, all that God has is mine. Hallelujah. Father's hand is just. His heart is a heart of compassion. And his house is full. I am so glad that God is my father. I don't want to blame God for my mistakes. I don't want to think that when I come back to God, he will not restore me. I don't want to be jealous and competitive about what God does through other people. I just want to focus on what God wants to do through me because that's what he looks at and what he rewards. God is my father. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. I'm so delighted to be his child and I want to walk with him and do his will and bring others into the restoration that God has for them. None of this means that God is not a holy God and that he desires us to live holy and righteous and sanctified before him by the power of the Holy Spirit. It only means this is the heart of God and there is no end to his compassion and there is no end to his forgiveness and he can do the impossible for us. Hallelujah.
Father, we just thank you because your word strengthens us. And as we depart into the world that you have created, that you have put us in, help us, Lord, to be thankful that you are a just Father, that you are a compassionate Father. Your heart is full of compassion. Lord, that your house is full of everything we need, not only for ourselves, but for others. And let us give them the bread of life. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. And now may the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship and communion of the blessed Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen.